Good morning, everyone. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to day two, the final and short day. I hope you've all enjoyed the conference so far. Um, one quick announcement before I turn it over to Kathy and Laura. So session 5B, self-sustenance as an archives leader, um, has unfortunately been canceled. The, the speaker for that presentation had a family emergency. So 5A should still be going on. Um, it's just 5B will be canceled. All right. So another couple of things before we get started. Because we are recording this and going through Zoom, um, the folks at home who are attending virtually cannot hear us um, unless we have the microphone. So for this discussion, we're trying this out. We'll see how it works. Um, but when I finish, I'm going to lay this microphone down on this middle table that no one is sitting at. Um, if you have something to say, you want to join in the conversation, feel free to come up and grab it. You can pass it around after that. Um, however you want to do it or lay it back on the table, whichever works for you. Um, for our friends at home, um, this, the computer is actually hooked up through the speakers. So if you want to open your mic and talk, you can do that. You can also drop questions into the chat and we'll make sure um, that we pass those along or comments either way. All right. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Laura Surratt and Kathy Miller. Um, and that we're going to start talking about best, best practices for archival term positions. All right. Ladies. I also want to just bring attention to our beautiful makeshift um, uh, comb here provided by Hollinger boxes. Um, so also, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final. Hello. Technology, am I right? Um, good morning. My name is Laura Starrett, and I am the Senior Collections Archivist at Emory University Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library in Atlanta, Georgia. And I am so grateful to be here to open a conversation about the topic of term labor and archives and special collections. And also to talk a little bit about the term labor best practices report that I was fortunate enough to be a part of. So Kathy reached out to me at one point to do a presentation on this report and, and talk about experiences in term labor. And I was so excited to jump at the chance. Um, when she told me that it was gonna be the plenary, I realized what a great opportunity it was to not only like show more people about this report, but also to get feedback and suggestions. Um, and so I really hope you've had your coffee, that you are ready to talk, that you have put the beach behind you and you are ready for work. Um, so I guess next slide. Yep. Um, as a member of the education committee, um, I do wanna make sure that everyone knows that SGA does not tolerate harassment in any form. This slide is pretty comprehensive, but to keep uh, on track time-wise, and also just because we've talked about this before, just be kind, be clear, um, be open to other people's views and criticisms. And as we heard in the keynote, clear is kind, but I also wanna remind you that honesty is not separate from tact. Um, in addition, we have a land acknowledgement. <laughs> Next slide. Um, uh, and again, for the, in the interest of time, I'll leave this up for a few moments, but I want to kind of get to the main, so we have more time to, to speak about the topic. Right. Um, and here's a little outline of what we're going to be covering. I'm going to give you a little background and some of the issues that we face. Um, Kathy is going to talk about the impact of term labor and her experience, and then we can have a discussion and then we'll have some closing thoughts. Okay, so I kind of want to just kind of go with where we started. So there was an ad hoc working group on term labor best practices that came together following the 2020 SA annual meeting. The initial discussion actually started after a session called Looking Back to Move Forward, Evaluating the Hidden Collections Era in Archives and Special Collections. This session and the discussions on the archival processing Slack channel focused on that hidden collection era, the growing reliance on grant funded projects and the prevalence of temporary positions, as well as the conflict tension and instability inherent in relying on term labor. That soon included a conversation on the fact that we lack any real best practices on eth the ethical creation of these positions and how that fact actually led to the rise in harmful and unethical postings. 
Uh, following the conference, Allison Clemens, the access strategist for special collections at Beinecke, posted an open invitation to anyone on the archival processing Slack channel to attend an initial meeting to discuss how we could fill the gaps identified during the conference. So a core group began meeting to discuss how to approach this discussion and started to work out best practices for creating positions that can meet the needs of both the hiring organizations and archival professionals. Um, while it's not a new issue, nor is it one that is only affected, only affects the GLAM professions, this new wave of discussion was sparked by a 2018 bargaining session between the University Council, American Federation of Teachers, and UCLA. <laughs> um, five archivists and one library, I'm sorry, next one, sorry, I missed one. Um, five archivists and one librarian, all, all on temporary appointments, put forth a detailed list on the harm of temporary appointments. Um, <clears throat> That harmful, the harm that temporary appointments inflict on the librarians and institutions in a June 2018 letter. And they cited nine main points. There's a lot of text on this, but I'm gonna read a lot to you. Um, the cycle of hiring wastes the time and resources of both the hiring organization and of the applicants through recruitment, multiple interviews, the hiring and onboarding. In addition, temporary staff must apply for other positions before their end date, which causes an increased turnover. That continued hiring also costs the special collections time and resources through the recurring training and other onboarding of new staff. As temporary staff must constantly look for ways to improve their own work histories and apply for new positions, we actually start creating a less invested workforce. Temporary positions by nature um, diminish the institutional knowledge of a place. This inhibits long-term planning and decision-making because that relies on stable or predictable staff. Um, the inability to be involved in long-term projects, peer-reviewed opportunities, or in some cases funding, hinders professional development of the individual. Temporary librarians do not have the opportunity to get raises. They have to move more often, and they might experience longer periods of unemployment, which is financially harmful. In addition, the precarity of temporary positions disproportionately affects people of color and places more barriers to entry into the profession. Personal lives are affected as job insecurity negatively affects one's ability to make major life decisions. As they say, there's no vacation when you're job searching. And temporary uh, archival positions as the status quo sends the inaccurate message that um, repeated short-term and fluctuating staff can meet long-term institutional needs, which implicitly devalues our work and our status as professionals. This letter was accompanied by over 60 pages, not signatures, pages of uh, endorsements and comments. And while I'm proud to say that I got to work with four of the six professionals who created and submitted that letter, I wanna make it very clear that this was not the only group that is talking about this. <clears throat> In January of 2020, the document Do Better, Love Us was published. In July 2021, the Society of California Archivists Labor Issues Task Force released their final report on uh, temporary physicians. And in 2018, as a reaction to the UCLA uh, issue, uh, the New England Archivist put out a statement against long-term contingent labor, noting results from their 2016 study that said temporary employment is both widespread in our region and embedded within the institutions in which many of us work. The New England Archivist followed up their 2016 survey with an updated 21, 2021 survey, finding that more than half of the surveyed jobs were for contingent jobs, and more than 70% of the terms lasted less than a year. They found that 37 people are leaving the profession due to the, the nature of contingent labor, and also 40% of those are brand new professionals. And this is not some outlier study. The working group found that in the last five years, at least a dozen surveys and articles that document this phenomenon. And this is without even going into the use of labor by incarcerated people by li library vendors. While there might be some benefit to temporary positions, it is widely agreed that term labor negatively impacts us on every stage of our careers, as well as the institutions and the professions as a whole. And this is why at the heart of these recommendations that we put forth, the principle is said that term labor should be an exceptional use and only used to fill archival work that is truly of a finite nature and that doesn't meet any operational core standards or needs. <laughs> Well, we can see that there's a background on the prevalence of term positions. We also started to notice that the people who were talking most about these positions found them to be less than great. Um, so I've been in the profession for 
a while. And I even remember back to when I first started um, discussions about how those of us in the glam fields have a certain level of privilege simply because we could afford the entry fee into the profession. During one of my first SAA conferences, the archivist behind Derangement and Description, the online comic, put together a, a, a comic called The Post SAA Howl. Um, and I'm going to read it to you because it's not all there, but it said, I saw a new archivist of my generation destroyed by burnout, starving, desperate, unemployed, dragging themselves to internships where they worked for nothing but the promise of good work experience. Idealistic scholars accumulating debt for a degree that guaranteed nothing, who delayed plans for houses and marriages and children, citing the uncertainty of their chosen vocation, who relied on the income of partners they otherwise regarded as their equals, who vented to me outside the hotel before leaving the conference that she used her vacation time to attend, as the illusion of equality among colleagues ended with the last plenary session. Now, per the working group's report, term positions can negatively impact archivists at any stage of their career. I say at all stages of their career. New professionals find that their temporary positions are all that are offered since those positions actually target entry and early career professionals. And this is a waterfall effect that leads to the struggle of mid-career archivists in finding permanent stagnation, um, sorry, in, in finding permanent positions offering salaries commensurate with their skills and experience. Due to the wage stagnation at the very earliest points of the, these careers, as archivists start to hit their later career stages, they will never have gotten to the point of compensation or responsibility that matches their years of profession. These circumstances are even more pronounced for BIPOC archivists as institutions rush to create diversity initi initiatives, which, put, which position lack of representation as an issue to be addressed, rather than as a long-term investment in people and skills. In fact, there have been a growing number of diversity positions, mainly fellowships or term and contract positions and internships at, aimed at people of color with almost an impossible ask of fixing the organization's issues in regards to diversity and inclusion. But while these discussions usually focus on the individual, it's not the, just the person in the actual world that suffers. Most people don't consider that this is a process that is also detrimental to institutions and permanent staff. I think this one. Boy. I'm not, I'm sure I'm not alone when I start to think about this problem that the really only person who wins in these term positions is the organization, right? You know, often temporary positions are funded by outside organizations like grant funding groups. So the institution's allowed to stretch their budget. They can do a little bit more. On the surface, it seems like an obviously beneficial situation, but it's really not a net positive. I'm sure some of you have heard, oh, well, it's not ideal. We can hire someone to at least start this project and, you know, we can continue working on it, you know, in our spare time after they, the contract is over, right? So we, can't, we kind of always end up with open, open projects. Usually these projects tend to fall under the realm of processing, um, especially collections that have been long held and never kind of moved up the line in priority to be processed. And so there's a risk that our collections are just kind of moldering away without any access. So yes, in some way there is a benefit to our audiences and users if we ever get that spare time to finish the project. And also, yes, it does create a position that otherwise may never have been opened. So new professionals can get experience or at least get paid, right? Um, but term positions have a very real negative impact on institutions themselves. Project work results in high turnover, unfinished work, and a loss of institutional memory, which has downstream impacts on collection development, collection management, and public services. In deciding to engage in term positions, organizations make a significant investment in time, money, and personnel to recruit, onboard, train, and orient team staff. And these expenses are lost as each term uh, position term ends. Institutions that use term positions may not consider the lost resources, nor the institutional or detailed knowledge that the term worker takes with them at the end of their service, especially regarding the work of reference and donor relations. <clears throat> So I think everyone here kind of knows that high turnover leads to low staff morale, but there's little acknowledgement that the term positions are actually just planned staff turnover. Um, the effects of low morale have been studied by our own keynote speaker who spoke on this yesterday, um, Katrina Davis Kendrick, who said that anxiety, depression, burnout, and decreased performance are all indicators of um, low morale. And these all in turn further decrease the quality of the institution's services and collection stewardship. And that's a pretty big issue because now you have fewer staff, lower morale, more instances of emotional distress, all culminating in decreased performance while also dealing with incomplete projects and having uh, staff have to play catch up and learn simply because we've lost that institutional or project knowledge. 
And again, Katrina Kendrick mentioned in her keynote, I swear I did a lot of this research before we had the keynote. I didn't even know she was coming. So I was just like, I was over here, like just like fangirling out. Um, but she mentioned in her keynote that there are ad additional detrimental issues that BIPOC professionals face, including discriminatory, discriminatory practices, offensive content, microaggressions, overt aggressions, in addition to all of the things that we, I've mentioned in the previous slides. Institutions should remember that if they are unable to diversify their staff, they will be limited and unable to meet the needs of their collection and the communities they serve, hindering the basic goals of collection development, access, and public outreach and services. The working group included impacts on the BIPOC professionals into the other sections covering the impacts of individuals and institutions as a matter of course, but on further discussion, we realized that there needed to be a more specific uh, conversation. Um, and so the most obvious point, as I mentioned before, was the diversity residency programs that are aimed at recruiting people from underrepresented groups. The very concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that is inherently impacted by temporary interim positions. Institutional DEI work and a movement toward a more diverse archival profession are urgent ongoing needs that must be carried out by the profession as a whole, and not the responsibility of brand new pro professionals in temporary roles. A lot of great work has come out of these residencies, and one of the outcomes has been an increase in underrepresented communities, but they're problematic because they end without further permanent positions. Because of their temporary roles, some positions are not structured or supported, and some come with completely unrealistic expectations for, again, brand new professionals in temporary roles. Um, as Katrina and her co-writer Iona Damasco wrote in their Low Morale and Ethnic and Racial Minority Academic Librarians, programs like ALA Spectrum Initiative and the Kaleidoscope Program offer racial and ethnic minorities structured points of entry into the field. However, they were hard to implement, they didn't always get the required support, and a review of ALA's own reports showed that between 2017 and 2019, ethnic and uh, racial and ethnic minority groups require uh, recruitment into the S LIS field remains stagnant. A closer look at diversity initiatives revealed a very real additional addition of invisible labor required by minority academic librarians to fit into a historically hegemonic and exclusive professional culture, white culture. Diversity initiatives need to be seen as long-term investments in people and not just the people actively working on their projects, but the whole institution staff. Institutions and professionals working in those organizations should start with a strong understanding of what has already been done in their organizations and in others, and they should evaluate and identify how to implement a meaningful program before creating these diversity focused temporary positions to ensure that there is a success in the position's goal, as well as a success for the individual that they put in that role. Um, oh, no, keep going. Keep going. the next one. All right, so this has kind of been the overview of what we identified in the working group as the main issues that we wanted to kind of solve. There's no solving it. Um, but while covering a topic that focuses on the human element of our profession, I think it's important to hear stories from colleagues who have lived this. As Katrina mentioned yesterday, we need to look into the narrative of it. Kathy Miller, perhaps you've heard of her, she is the current president of SGA, um, has some experience with term labor and will speak about her own personal experiences and her reaction to the report. This, she has an experience as an intern in the Yellowstone National Park Archives at NARA at the CNN Library and has continued with positions at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, Heritage Works and Quick Creek. She is currently the Atlanta University Center's Woodruff Library um, at, as a grant funded, grant funded digitization project manager. So I'm going to hand this over to her for a little bit and let her talk about the real world impact of this. All right. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so I'm going to read from my notes here, y'all, because I'm not an extemporaneous speaker. Uh, so speaking from my own current experience working in a term position, which as Laura mentioned is the grant funded digitization project manager at the Atlanta University Center Woodruff Library. Um, I'll just offer the following brief reflections and resonances with the information that was provided in the report. Uh, and the first two notes I make will be a bit of a broken record harping on the same point, but I think it's an important point to make. So just bear with me and, and, and apologize for the a bit of redundancy. 
So regarding the guidelines for term positions laid out in the executive summary of the report, I would add to this the comment that employers should not gauge the productivity of permanent employees based off of the work accomplished by term employees who often have a singular focus in their hire and may also be exempt from other responsibilities that permanent employees do have, such as having to work reference desk shifts, library committee responsibilities, it runs the gamut. Um, for example, those are responsibilities that I am currently exempt from in my position. And so I can have this sole focus of work, which frankly gives me more time in the day. To quote from the report, temporary labor is particularly detrimental to sustainable and holistic collection stewardship. This is true in the points raised in the report, but also in the sense that you cannot use the work done for a term-based project as a gauge for what should happen with all other collections. It's an unrealistic expectation. In my job, my focus is digitizing a portion of the Joseph Eccles and Evelyn Gibson Lowry collection. While no digitization numbers were set for Lowry, i.e. that we needed to hit 2% of the overall collection digitized or 2% from each record series, um, the amount we already have digitized and uploaded to our online repository is already greater than two thirds of the other archival collections that we have online. Therefore, to tout the digitization numbers accomplished for Lowry as an achievable goal for the work of permanent employees working on the other archival collections at the AUC is a pipe dream. So let's see here, I outlined the best practices, but I don't need to read those out. Those are in the report. Y'all can read what the best practices are. Um, oh, but I'll state them because I'm actually reflecting on them, apologies. So the best practices as laid out in the report are determining the nature of the work, compensation and qualifications, posting the position, setting the incumbent up for success, and supporting the term worker in their transition to future positions. And in reflecting on these five best practices outlined in the report, I will say that my overall experience in my term position is one where these practices were implemented, were implemented for the most part. Uh, but granted, I came to this term position as a mid-career archivist with a few years of experience already to point to, which, I mean, as Laura pointed out, term positions can impact archivists across the spectrum, whether you're a new professional coming into the field or mid-career or late career. Um, but I think I also need to point to the privilege of, of being a white woman in this scenario. I just, I'm, that privilege is playing into how I feel about this term position and my experience within it. Um, so with all that being said, I was largely able to hit the ground running with the project work that needed to happen. However, I am happy that the time was invested to train and fully inform the term digitization te technician that was hired to work with me. While also a term limited role, I felt that it is incumbent on me to invest the time to provide my coworker with all of the training she needs to be successful in her job and to seek additional training opportunities for her that will give her experience in as many areas of archives digitization work as possible, thus making her a stronger candidate for future jobs which is also something I've actively encouraged her to do, start searching for new opportunities. Would I say that the term position I am in follows uh, the best practices playbook perfectly? No. Was it a good faith effort? Yes. The last impression I will put out there though is that the labor I have put into building up and supporting my coworker comes from a personal conviction of mine that we as archivists who have been in the field for five to 10 years uh, plus must pay it forward to new professionals and invest the time needed in building those new professionals up. I have thought on this a lot as of recent, but our capitalist productivity driven society makes us think that spending an hour talking to our colleagues about the profession, about just general thoughts or specifics of things going on in the profession is a waste of time, or at least such as the guilt I have felt after taking an hour to talk with my coworkers. But then I think about how important conversations about the current state of the field or talking about how to pursue new job opportunities are. And I'm really, really glad that I took that hour. Um, and just in closing, um, this was, Laura had made the, the comment about term positions not being unique to the archival profession. And it had me thinking about the revolving door of jobs that my father pursued as an electrical, electrical engineer when I was a child. Um, 
And then that had me reflecting back on the conversation from the keynote yesterday where Leah had asked about the prevalence of low morale in other career fields and kind of having that comparison point. Anyways, just general reflections of the fact that, you know, these are not problems that are unique to us, but they are obviously problems that we as a profession do need to solve for how it best fits our, our profession. Um, but I will speak personally from the fact of, you know, my father working term positions as an electrical engineer as a child, like he, we stayed in our home in Warner Robins, Georgia, and he moved away and lived in like five or six different states across the, so I don't, I don't really know my father. So like speaking about long-term impacts of term labor, like that's, that's something that I deal with as an adult navigating my relationship with my father, because I didn't really grow up with him. And not saying that exact same scenario could play out for archivists who are in term labor positions, but just an interesting personal reflection that I think it's worth closing out um, my reflections on this report with. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Laura and I think we're heading into a discussion slide next where we can get y'all engaged in this conversation. Okay, so as I said, you had a few minutes about 30 minutes to have some coffee, get yourselves hyped up. Um, and so we basically have three discussion points um, to talk about. And while I gave you a lot of background, I'm kind of hoping for some more practical, hopeful, you know, forward moving ideas. Um, I know that me personally, I tend to get caught up in like, well, it's not fair and it's not right. But in order to make sure that we are continuing to move our profession forward, we have to admit that these positions are not going away. Um, so the first point um, is discussing what would be a practical project for a term position and conversely, what projects don't have strong arguments for term work. And maybe what could we could take those positions that are not um, and what can we change about them to make them um, stronger uh, term positions? Have you seen any uh, positions that you thought were good fits? Have you seen any that were terrible, but you think they could have changed something? Um, the second point is how would you create language that is clear and transparent for engaging with the term position? How would you ensure that you're making the strong case for this position while being honest and about you know, the position itself and the future of the, the applicant in this organization? How are you setting it up for success? Also, the question of compensation is always a big concern. You never know what to apply for because you don't know what they're offering and they won't tell you because it's commensurate with experience. So if you want to discuss why or why you don't put those uh, that information in or why you would like to see that information, we'd love to hear about that. And finally, how would you set up the position to ensure that there is support for any new professional coming into your organization, um, not only within the confines of this role that you've hired them for, but also in setting them up for continued success in the profession, whether it's professional development or clear reporting structures. So there's a bunch of different topics and I will take suggestions on any of them. Um, I'm going to take my mask off to talk. Um, this is, a, I guess, kind of tangential, but I really think that uh, we as a profession ought to be talking to granting agencies about implementing these kinds of um, practices when there are term positions. And I, sp I speak from my experience being on the Digitizing Hidden Collections uh, uh, grant review panel the number of times I have seen positions that are way underpaid, uh, that it is, you know, unreasonable amounts of work, um, no ramp up, it's, it's crazy. And one of the great things about the, the clear DHC panel is, is that we really look at those issues when we are deciding whether or not to fund a project. So I think we need to also be advocating to um, foundations and, and the like. I agree, I once had the opportunity to be a uh, grant supporter and, um, oh God, I keep turning them on now. Hello? Oh, um, and, I'm trying to do it all. Um, and one of the positions came in and it would have had a good salary if they wanted to do it one year, but they wanted to break it up. So it would be two years of part-time work for 
less than the cost of living. And so it's like, no, 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 no. So I don't think it's going to be that hard for people to really kind of look into how that affects people. I just wanted to follow up on, on Sheila's comment um, in terms of grants, because I think also talking to those granting agencies that the that the institution doesn't necessarily get the funding if they can't follow up and fund the position beyond the grant period in some cases, depending on what that grant is for. Um, because I think that also holds the institution that is requesting that money to the fire. Now, granted, um, I know some smaller organizations, so it kind of depends on the grant and what you're asking for. But I know for my institution, I'm always advocating for more staffing and better pay, all that stuff. Being at a state institution, we all know that our budgets keep shrinking. But what they're trying to do is fill that gap with this grant funding. And that's what we're getting pressured to do a lot is to fill that gap with the grant funding. And so if the grant um, agencies are, I, I don't know, I'm sure some of them, some people at the granting agencies are aware of that, but I do think that should be something that we're advocating back to the granting agencies is, hey, maybe this shouldn't be a gap filler um, when these in institutions need to make sure that they can continue to support um, this work beyond the scope of the grant. And it, again, it depends on the grant, it depends on the granting agency um, and the institution, but I do think that there are a lot of institutions that are really um, leaning heavily into granting to fill the gaps that they should be filling themselves. So is anyone monitoring chat? <laughs> That's my first question. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, and then uh, I want to say that diversity positions should never be a term position. Actually, in my personal opinion, they shouldn't exist. Um, you should be focusing from the top to add diversity to your um, institutions and not asking people of color to do that for you. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah, so that's how I feel about those. I have never and will never apply for one. So. It's just not something I consider a good organizational practice. So I think people should consider that when they're thinking about adding diversity to their institution. Um, speaking on behalf of organizations that have in-house um, AV, digitization units or any other digitization units, I would say another um, argument against a term work employee would be those positions that require a tremendous amount of unique skills and training in order to be done. Um, as a vendor ourselves, I know it's incredibly hard to find folks and train folks who are invested in that sort of work. Um, and then when they leave, you know, it's, it's like that time is kind of spent. It's a, it's a cost center for us at that point. So, um, you know, I know it's a little different for your institutions, but that skill set is really, really valuable. And I would argue that it's not appropriate for term work. We have a couple of things in the chat. Um, one, uh, going forward, uh, can we have people identify themselves as when they start speaking? Um, and then we had a comment um, a little while ago saying, uh, James says, agree with the current speaker. Since many of these positions are grant funded, these guidelines need to be part of the grant process because some institutions are uh, not going to, oops, where did it go? Um, we're not going to implement these guidelines unless they, uh, they were, uh, unless they are forced to, sorry, I'm struggling. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's it. Well, I guess I have also something to say, I'm Lisa Vallon. 
Um, before my current position, I was in a grant funded term position, um, but I was considered full time faculty. It was a weird place to be, but I really did benefit that they considered me faculty. I was expected to do service and serve on committees. I was expected to attend conferences and do professional development and present about the project. And I think that really did um, give me a better experience and set me up to find a full-time permanent position. So I think as we are developing these grant funded positions, we need to add in money for professional development. We need to allow them time to serve on committees, especially if they're new to the profession so they can beef up their resume so that they don't get stuck in the cycle of going from term position to term position um, because you don't get retirement benefits. Uh, you don't have that sense of stability. You can't put down roots and feel like you belong to a, co a community and it really does start to affect you. Um, and it was why I left my term position early because uh, they had promised they were gonna fundraise money to keep me there, you know, long-term and endow a position, but they never made strides to raise money. They raised not a single dime to um, keep me full-time. And so I left early because I didn't wanna deal with that instability anymore. Hi, I'm Ann Merriman. I'm from the University of South Carolina Upstate. Um, I just, I guess, have a, an observation or a comment because I feel like, um, at least at my institution, I'm really between a rock and a hard place because the, ha the idea of having a grant funded position, I've got a very large collection that I have zero time to address. And I'm basically a lone arranger situation. So it's myself and one um, full-time non-library trained um, person. So there's not time to do it. Um, and I keep considering like, is there a way that I can grant fund to have this, this collection that would be a huge benefit, um, you know, addressed maybe in two or three years. But I also recognize that these positions are not permanent. I myself, when I was looking for my first um, library job, would not apply to term positions because of the instability. So it's a real conundrum because you have these instances where you can't get something done unless you do it grant funded, but you also recognize that grant funding positions is inherently ha has these these problems, these issues. So it's just, I guess it's a just more of a commentary on that's that's the struggle is real. <laughs> can y'all hear the folks at home or should we type into the chat? We can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. um, um, I just want you would be able to like add extra or offer more support for a project position to come in and, and get the experience in processing, but also learn extra uh, uh, skills in order to make them more profitable on the mar on the in the in the marketplace. Uh, you need to speak into the mic. Oh, I probably also should have included that we're a state institution who has had our budget severely cut, and we have positions that are frozen that I can't fill. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to think around the, the corners of all of this, but I, I just think in the general uh, climate we are in right now, it's very much a stuck. What, we don't have a, we have good climate, people can hire. <laughs> okay, we have a person uh, virtually who would like to say something, please go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to second this idea of, um, kind of the flip side of a good term position. I mean, a good term position should have fairly defined parameters, but then the flip side of that, especially for people new to the profession, is that they don't have the opportunity to build a diverse skill set in that position um, sometimes. Uh, so yeah, we should definitely be conscious if we're if we have people, especially new to the profession, who are in a term position that they get the opportunity to not just do professional development, but understand, learn, get exposed to all the different facets of their institution, all the different kinds of archival work and projects going on there, and you know, have something on their resume that they can use as a jumping off point. 
I just wanted to second a, few, a couple other people have made similar points. Uh, uh, Rebecca Brown with the Portman Archives, and I actually wanted to add to that that maybe in this term position, could we make it more kind of also including it as an internship or experience for uh, new professionals or professionals that are um, about to graduate because I know I went through the Clayton State program and one of the hardest things was finding that um, ex work experience in order to graduate so that's something we can kind of look into. I hope you're enjoying the very slow disco effect we have going on in the room, whether I see going down and up. <laughs> exactly. Um, I do have a question. How many people um, have organizations where they post the compensation range, the, the compensation range or amounts on their exact amount? So what organization are you at? Athens Clark, Clark County Library. Yeah, so you, you post, I worked there before, <laughs> in a temporary position. <laughs> and some, someone else? So it looks like there's only a, a handful um, of people who actually do that. Um, have you ever asked why or um, if you can post salaries in your positions? Or have you, does anyone have an answer to why or why not they do that? We have one. I'm Brittany Newberry from Georgia State University. I'm not talking about my current position in this manner. So at a previous one, it was technically academic, but a nonprofit. So they weren't required to um, post salaries. They did it for a few positions and people complained because their salaries did not match up with what they were posting for these positions. Um, so, higher ups decided not to continue doing it, but it also means you're getting people applying for things that say digital, thinking they can make IT money, and no, that's not the thing. So I would, I mean, honestly, if I was there, I would be like, oh, sorry, like we should probably look into our salaries for our current employees and still keep posting the um, salaries and job postings, but it wasn't my job. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Katie Toomey from also Portman Archives. Um, I'm looking at it from a strictly corporate archives view, but working for a business, I think it depends on if the higher ups realize or understand or acknowledge the importance of the archives compared to maybe the residential development team, which, you know, brings in money. Unfortunately, archives doesn't. And so I think in our case, in corporate archives, that's one of the barriers it's hard to explain. We're not making you money, but we're also keeping your records very nice and tidy, which in the long run is going to really help you. Um, I don't know. That's just one thing I've noticed. We have a, a comment in the chat from James. Uh, we pointed out to our administration that we could not post positions without that info in many places, and that would hurt recruitment. Yes, and I was also one of the people that advocated for salary transparency that SGA has a statement on now, um, because I have had issues in the past at our current institution at Georgia State University, um, particularly with faculty positions. Staff positions will automatically get a salary range posted just because that is how the university does it. With faculty, it is up to the dean. And one of the things that I have gone back and forth with, also keep in mind that state institutions, um, those are public. Your salaries are public. You can look them up on the web. Um, and sometimes there were a couple, I think, that were posted without any salary. But most of the time, they're at least a range. But one of the things that I constantly go back and forth on is what that range is. And is it realistic? Is that really what? you're going to hire somebody at. So don't say that it's the range is, you know, 
60 to 75 if you're not willing to negotiate. Um, don't go there. If, if your range is really 55 to 60, just say it, just say it. Um, and I've also noticed because it's so wishy-washy, it really depends on the position, the person. And um, I had a situation where um, one of the employees, he told me after this employee was brought on that he lowballed her because he knew she was married and her husband worked at Emory, which I did report to HR, by the way. <laughs> so just keep that in mind sometimes. So that is what I often am advocating against. And another reason I told him I was going to do the salary transparency thing at SGA and that he would never be able to post those jobs. And I've also advocated SAA because they often will try and post there because of exactly that situation. We only have a few minutes left and I'm perfectly happy not doing closing because this is a good discussion. Um, but one other thing I would like everyone to kind of keep in mind are what are the points that you think would really help move a position from kind of being more predatory for lack of, of a better word, um, in order to like really help success. Um, like when you were first starting out, what were the skills that you needed in a job that you never felt you got or that you want, that you think would really help people move into that? But um, I had hands up before I made this comment, so. Uh, this is Sheila from the Digital Library of Georgia. I also wanna um, really advocate for the idea that um, we need to be paying interns and we need to be paying interns more money. Um, we are making if with free internships and expecting free labor, including intellectual labor, we are, we are, we are privileging people who can afford to do that. And so we're not gonna make our, um, our profession more diverse. Um, and um you know it kills me that we have like i i the our state's digital digital encyclopedia does not pay for articles and that's crazy they are also and let me just say that they are incredibly underfunded but this is you know many of us work in academic um academic institutions and there is this idea that you have to sh pay your dues and do all of this free labor and it's a bunch of anyway okay so i think do we have any more in the chat real quick uh just uh mandy 100 percent agreeing with sheila okay. so we're gonna do one more comment and then we'll close it up it's on. Okay. Uh, this is Pamela and I. Uh, I'm at Westminster. Um, I've got, I want to say like amen to like everything that's been said so far. And as someone who has had permanent positions, I've worked the unpaid internships. I have been on grant funded stuff. And um, I have to say there's so many good ways that we can really improve the situation of someone who is doing some term work and like one of the conundrums is you're expected to have all this experience, but how are you gonna get all this experience if you don't even get the, the job? So I think part of what needs to be worked in is being a little more flexible, being willing to you know teach the person so they can have skills to go on. And if you don't have position, maybe you could be an advocate for, hey, I think the position's opening up over here. Let me get you in touch with so-and-so. You know, so like even if you don't have a position in your own, institution and you know you could be the advocate for that that person especially if they're a new professional and um you know i'm working on trying to get internships set up where i'm at and they're fully on board of yes we need to pay them and let's get all the hr stuff set up and once we get all that done then we'll start posting so i'm glad things are in some places you know shifting but i think there needs to be more support for the new professionals to help kind of launch them, you know, so. So 
Oh, we're gonna have to wrap it up. I'm so sorry. Okay, so I'm not going to keep you very long because you have 10 minutes before you go on to your, your next sessions, but um, I want to thank you for the discussion. I'm glad you had your coffee. I'm glad that we had some excitement with the disco. Um, thank you to everyone who, uh, who uh, came in virtually. Your conversation was definitely important. And just most of us here are probably not in a position where we could make these changes, but if you are, please go forward. If you aren't, please keep considering how you can help our new professionals. Because I always, even from the time I started, which was... Uh, a long time ago, over a decade, there was still this talk about eating our young. Like we're making them go into debt. We're making them, you know, do all of these things and work for free and get experience. And then they come out and there's nothing for them. So we need to really kind of focus on how do we continue making sure that the people that we have going through schools are getting the experience they need to become stronger professionals? And how do we make sure that our profession continues to be or continues to grow and become stronger? Because there's so many suggestions on opening up things, but how do we work together to make sure that we are pulling up people behind us as we keep going? So thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, have a great time.